welcome to all for you this is the new the new conference and okay it is impossible to summarize in few words the extensive activity of dr paul ho so um let me introduce professor ho in spanish please <laughs> so it's better um ya que es una costumbre hacer las presentaciones en, en español. Eh, les cuento, bueno, que el, el doctor Paul Ho eh, es graduado y posteriormente obtuvo su doctorado en el MIT. Los intereses científicos del doctor Ho incluyen, entre un montón de otras cosas, proceso de formación de estrellas, agujeros negros, estudio de galaxias, estructuras cosmológicas, y su trayectoria lo han llevado a que este, actualmente esté ocupando lugares muy importantes, tales como eh, director general del James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, director general, de, general del East Asian Observatory, participando en lo que es como investigador principal en el Greenland Telescope, hace unos minutos no estuvo comentando acerca de eso, eh, participando en el, en el instrumento METIS del ELT, participando desde sus inicios como investigador principal en ALMA, participando también en el SMA, en el Sun Millimeter Array, desarrollando también, participando como desarrollando en, en, el, en la Hyper Supply Cam del telescopio Subaru. Y un infinidad de, de, de participaciones en proyectos de envergadura. Posee más de 400 publicaciones internacionales en revistas de, de primer nivel. So, we welcome Paul with his presentation, Growth of Submillimeter Wavelength Astronomy in Taiwan. And we invite, invite him to start with his talk. Paul, can you share your presentation yep thank you very much um okay it's, you can see that yes it's good it's fine okay. so thank you very much for inviting me to uh, your colloquium series uh, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, explain what we've been doing in taiwan which i think uh, has some uh, parallel to what you are trying to develop uh, in argentina and brazil especially in terms of submillimeter wave astronomy so hopefully uh, what we are doing uh, will be of interest uh, to how uh, we can grow together, uh, not only in the Asia, but also uh, together with you, I hope, uh, in South America. Uh, what you see here, of course, is a picture of the top of Mauna Kea. Uh, in the foreground uh, is, is the uh, JCMT being lit up at night. And you can see uh, on the left of that, on the screen is the submillimeter array uh, alongside with its building, the assembly building. So we are in the so-called millimeter valley on top of Mauna Kea. We are down a little bit from the top, very top. And uh, if you continue going to the left, uh, that would be the site of the uh, proposed uh, 30 meter telescope uh, construction further down uh, to the left. Now, uh, of course, you are all familiar with this, but I go through this uh, to explain how Taiwan wound up in this particular uh, development. So back in the 1990s, um, uh, Frank Xu and Fred Lowe was asked to come back to Taiwan to try to help initiate astronomy. And when Frank Xu, who's a theoretician, uh, landed in Taiwan, he looked up in the sky and thought, uh, well, the sky here is uh, opaque. You know, there's no chance to do optical uh, astronomy and so on. So he thought, well, we need to find Fred Lowe, who's radio astronomer. And uh, so Fred Lowe went to Taiwan and he dragged me along with him to go there. And we both flew into Taiwan. We look up in the sky and we said, uh, radio is also terrible here. You know, Taiwan's weather and the raining condition is just awful. So the question is, what should we do? And the answer was, you know, we need to get off the island, go to a place where the sky is good and uh, astronomy is in the frontier. And at that moment, you know, we have, of course, already built the VLA and uh, uh, Keck 
and Subaru and Gemini are yet to be built at that point, uh, but we know that they were coming in the optical domain. So in the radio, we thought that we would push to the highest wavelength band that's allowable from the, from the ground, and that's the submillimeter wavelength. Okay, so working at the submillimeter wavelength was trying to get to the window uh, where the sky is still uh, allow us to operate uh, before it becomes opaque. Uh, in the, in the infrared. So of course, we all know that the energy scales essentially as the temperature. So uh, the temperature for the radio at a wavelength of, you know, one meter to 300 micron, you can translate that to what that temperature would be, right? So uh, whereas our eyes are tuned to 6,000 degrees, uh, radio wavelength is tuned to 10 degrees or lower, you know? So it's the wavelength is so much longer and we are really addressing a very cold temperature. So the submillimeter wavelength is really targeting from this uh, 1000 micron or one millimeter to 300 micron, which is a range of three degrees to 10 degrees. Well, what is that range? Well, actually that's the bulk of the universe, right? The bulk of the universe in fact is cold. And you know, from the microwave onward, the microwave background, bulk of the universe is just very, very cold. And in the submillimeter, we are hoping that we can look into it. So the first 25 years of the IAA in Taiwan was tuned to be uh, working in this particular field. So there were many considerations uh, when we are growing in a vacuum. Growing in a vacuum means that, you know, there was practically no astronomy in Taiwan at that point in the 1990s. There were maybe five people with PhD working in astronomy. And they were optical astronomers. So to grow, you know, the first thing you always want to know is who is actually going to be leading this? Who is going to push it? And then how do you grow the funding? How do you get the funding? And we worried about that a lot, whether you, know, you can only depend on one source for your funding or what? And then how to grow the manpower when you start out with only a few people? And how do you focus on the problem? How do you sustain the future path in a sustainable way, right? You, know, you want to be able to grow and then still be continue to grow up to a certain level. And then how do you cultivate the next group of leaders once you start, right? And then establishing the right culture of how to do things and how to select the right vision. These were the things that we concern ourselves with. So at the beginning, we thought we had some principles to work on. You know, the first thing is that you have to focus on excellence. And excellence in the end is the, what we say, the ultimate defense against you know, people who might criticize you for whatever that you do, right? You have to say what you're doing is really the best thing that we can do. And you know, only when you are focused on the best things can you justify the using the, of all the money that we are projecting to use, right? And then you have to work at the frontier of the field. You know, Paul, so people, yeah. That's a question. You are always in the same, slide because we are always oh no you cannot see my slide going forward no no, no. oh no thank you for telling me oh. let me uh, get out and try again i didn't realize back up again okay so so the first slide of course was the top of mauna kea then i showed this slide in order to show that we are working in the submillimeter band which is you know in this band right below the infrared because the sky basically is opaque from this point on from the ground. And we worked on the last window from the ground, pushing from the radio side. And I was explaining that from the ground, it was terrible in Taiwan to begin with. Okay, you can see my next slide. Can you see this radio domain? Yes. Okay, yes. so here I am saying that, you know, basically at radio, we're working at three millikelvin to 10 Kelvin. If when you're working from a meter to 300 micron, right? Or more specifically, the submillimeter targets the very cold temperature of three to 10 degrees, which is of course the microwave background at three degrees and 10K is the bulk of the temperature of the universe, okay? So targeting astronomy in uh, the 25 years, uh, the submillimeter, uh, we worried about these issues, who was going to lead the program, how to grow the funding, how to grow the manpower, sustain the future. We worried a lot about how to do things because we were in a vacuum, because we had no people, no funding, no project, okay? So 
That's why in this mission statement early on, we focus on the concept that the excellence would defend us against the criticism of what we are going to do. And then we worked at the frontier. The reason why you work at the frontier is provide ourselves more time, right? If you were following on things that are already being done, then you know that by the time you're ready, people who are already doing the things that you're doing will have already gone ahead by years, right? So if you start at the frontier, it's very aggressive, but since you're at the frontier, everybody else is taking a long time to get there to get to work. So this gives you some time to uh, catch up. And then, of course, you have to focus. You cannot do everything. That's because you don't have enough resources to begin with. And then the internationally competitive program was very important because we're very conscious of the fact that when people are overseas, they will ask, why would they come back to an institute in Taiwan if they can have better job, better opportunity overseas, right? So to attract people to come back, you actually have to work on things that are very competitive. We focus on growing the manpower and we focus on working with the universities, which is very important. As a research organization, uh, we realize that the customer base is in the universities. So the universities will provide the students and they will have the future generation. And then we also work very hard to work with the industry because we want the industry to be involved locally so that we can put the budget back into the local system, right? We didn't want to just send the money overseas uh, to, to spend. So uh, the main issues are defined. The answer is to find what I call heroes, meaning people who are willing to actually have some sacrifice uh, in their career path in order to turn and do some things devoted to the system. And then very importantly, you have to have godfather or godmother who can actually help you solve problems. You know, no matter where we are, we will encounter the problems that we cannot solve. Somebody up top has to be able to help us. If we don't have that person, we cannot make progress. And then very important, we have to find partners and the partners are very important because it guarantees that you do not fail, okay? So we form teams both inside Taiwan and overseas and that ensuring success using people, using friends and working with friends to join projects that we know about already. And that means that these projects will of course by themselves go ahead and succeed no matter what we do so that when we join, we will not fail because we are not alone pushing things uh, from the very beginning, okay? And at that moment, we chose interferometry in order to leverage the money because basically we knew that uh, interferometry multiply as n square uh, of the number of telescopes so that even though you buy n, you can increase the power of the instrument uh, by, you know, by this power square, okay? And that allow us to leverage the amount of money that you spend uh, by enhancing uh, uh, what is already existing. So the path was going from BIMA and then onto the SMA. We started by training on BIMA and then involved in the SMA, which was just getting going under construction at that moment. And targeting Fred Lowe to come back, a radio astronomer, to lead the program. And the instrument building was, became submillimeter array. So at the beginning, you know, we recruited people, not only from Taiwan, but also from overseas, uh, Jeremy Lim came from Australia, Minho Choi came from Korea, Nagayoshi Ohashi came from uh, Japan. And then later on, the recruits you know, also were international, but more and more became uh, people that came from Taiwan. So here are just some numbers to review this comparison. You know, we have a population in Taiwan of 23 million, which is about 10%, 11% of Brazil, and maybe half of Argentina. The GDP today is about 669 billion in Taiwan. And that's again about half of Brazil and maybe one and a half times that of Argentina. So the numbers are close in terms of resources. Uh, well, our institute is one of 30 institutes, 31 institutes inside the Academia Sinica, which is the uh, equivalent to Germany, Max Planck uh, Societies, which runs number of institutes. Uh, by now, our institute has a history of about 27 years. The institute was formally became an institute about 10 years ago. Before that, we were in a, what we call a preparatory phase building up. 
And today the Institute has maybe about 200 people, about 30 PIs, about 35 graduate students. The budget is not quite 15 million, but around there, you know, 13 million, 14 million it changes from uh, year to year. Uh, so in a targeted field, a small group, a relative small group of people have been able to make progress. Uh, you can actually get to the frontier in a relatively short amount of time. So just to see the distribution, right? We have 40 faculty members, 31 in what we call tech uh, academic track. They are scientists basically. And then we have research faculties that are essentially focused on instrumentation. So that's very important for us, uh, the instrumentation program. We have adjunct faculties, visiting fellows, uh, support scientists uh, that are sp principally supporting most of our program. We have a large postdoctoral program, a pretty large size graduate students for us now. And then a technical staff that's fairly large on the order of 35 to 40 people. Working language is English. Although, you know, over time we have staff from all over the world. And that of course uh, forces us to be in English because uh, uh, official language is Chinese, but you know everyone, you know, can only com commonly communicate uh, via English. So this is why uh, it's actually a quite international organization. Uh, for the major project, just to run through, we have quite a few over time now. Uh, in these last twenty-five years, of course, I mentioned the submillimeter array that was completed uh, in two thousand and three, and then you know at the moment we are working on expanding the bandwidth and looking forward to multi-pixel system in the future. And then sometime along we built, this is a millimeter array here, the picture. And then somewhere along we built this uh, amoeba, which is a microwave background uh, interferometer on Mauna Loa. SMA is on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. This is on the other peak in uh, Hawaii Island on Mauna Loa. This worked at uh, lower frequency at about three millimeters in order to look at the uh, microwave background. And then at the same time, you know, we have a theoretical institute uh, together with uh, 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 actually with uh, Tsinghua University. And then uh, we went workshops, winter schools, and then we began to build a lab specifically to work on the junctions, the SIS junction work together with our collaborators at NAOJ and Purple Mountain Observatory. And now, you know, we can build junctions all the way into the uh, terahertz region. And then we also had optical instrument. This is a Taos-1 uh, 50 centimeter uh, optical telescope. We had a four element to study the outer parts of the solar system looking at transient objects. And now the second generation has been deployed uh, to, the, to Mexico uh, in the National Observatory. We have, four, <clears throat> we have three 1.3 meter uh, elements uh, now deployed in Mexico. And then we are working on uh, uh, theoretical uh, numerical calculations, developing hydro codes, and then also partnered with Canada France Hawaii telescope in working on the wide field infrared camera. And then the next generation just deployed Spiro. And then we began to work with Alma on two paths through the East Asia and North America. And there, you know, we have been building many equipment which has now been delivered to Alma and that include uh, our front end integration center where we integrated receiver systems. And then uh, we also uh, have various other things, uh, front end service vehicle and so on. And then of course, we have been working in the optical since the Taos program onto the Subaru project on the Mauna Kea, where we built the hyper supreme, hyper -supreme camera, the largest uh, wide field camera as a partner. And then lately we have been on the prime focus spectrometer, which is a, Again, a wide field multi fiber uh, spectrometer deployed uh, currently deploying on Subaru. And then finally, we've been working on the GLT that has been deployed in Greenland that I'll tell you about. And then the ELT, we've joined the ELT through the MEDIS program. Uh, this is a camera to working in the mid infrared uh, program. So um, these things, you know, multiple projects have been delivered over time. You might say, oh, you know, you guys are working on so many things. Uh, how do you manage? And the answer is that it's actually a sequence, right? We do not work on everything at once. It's a sequence of projects uh, to deliver these things. So if you're always working on so many things, of course, it cannot be done. 
So the sequence was that we have two arms, you know, there's the radio arm and there's the optical arm. So any one time we're working on one project until it's delivered and then start on the next one until it's delivered and then start on the next project until it's delivered and then go on moving this way, right? And similarly in the optical, we move from one project to the next and then one project to the next and then one project in Subaru to the next project. And now after finishing, then we move on to the next one. So at any one time, we have a major project in the radio and a major project in the optical. And then of course, facilities that are operating. So this is a sequence you can see something like uh, 15 years uh, after we begin to uh, really start to deliver things uh, in our construction program. So the submillimeter, it's the same thing that you are thinking uh, when we built the submillimeter array. The re main reason why we go there are two, right? One is that the dust scales as new to the fourth, right? The flux is increasing as new to the fourth because the dust emissivity itself has a very hard dependence on frequency, new square. But moreover, in the lines, the dependence is new to the fifth, and that's because of the Einstein A coefficient scaling as new to the three. So this is very important. It says that, you know, when you are working in the submillimeter, you can expect very bright spectral lines, okay? These are coming through because of the Einstein A. So when you're working in the centimeter, you know, you can hardly see any lines. But by the time you get to submillimeter, you have a forest of lines to work with. And then the dust, which is not detectable in radio, in centimeter or millimeter, will now become detectable in the submillimeter. And that is very important, okay, for our science. In particular, this is just to show in the submillimeter array in 2021, we have now published you know, 150 papers. But the most important thing is to be able to image on large scale. This is the uh, filament in Orion. Here is picture of the polarization properties. So the dust turns out uh, due to these uh, dust grains. I'm sorry. Are we okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Glo Glo Gloria? Okay. Is Thank you. Okay? I'm so sorry, Paul. No problem. Is there any question? Okay. No question, right? Should I continue? Can I continue? Yes. Ah, yes, okay. please. So, so this is just showing the dust map, right, in Orion. Uh, so this is something that obviously you guys can do with your telescope, right? And the key that I want to point out is that we can map the polarization properties uh, by work seeing that the dust emission is polarized because the grains are elongated. So when they're aligned by the magnetic fields, the light comes out in polarized mode, and then we can determine the direction of the uh, magnetic field. Okay, that's very important uh, for our studies. And then the instrument development is very important. You know, we have a very nice uh, laboratory in, uh, in uh, our building now in our institute. We started out at one of the universities, but we move our facilities into our own building. We have now our own uh, clean rooms where we can produce these devices uh, for various projects. And that project device uh, production uh, is uh, really good. We supply junctions for various people uh, for the SMA, but other groups as well, uh, such as uh, Korean, uh, KVN, we uh, supply their uh, mixer blocks, and we are happy to supply any, anybody who needs junctions. So when you are building a receiver, if you need junctions, you know, we can supply them for you. And this one is the microwave background experiment 2016, which has now uh, finished. Uh, in this experiment, you know, we are looking at the slight uh, cooling of the radiation uh, in a cluster of galaxies. Uh, this is due to the uh, 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 effect where the electrons are uh, slightly uh, shifting the background radiation. Uh, they are basically uh, reprocessing the light that passes through the cluster. So the microwave background has been affected by cluster. And this is a way to detect uh, distant clusters because it is operating on the microwave background. It is very different effect from the optical because an optical, as you go further away in distance, of course, it's emitted light is getting fainter. But since we are working on the microwave background from the origin of the universe, 
you know, that signal does not decrease. So the signature of the cluster remains there uh, even with uh, uh, distance uh, going further and further away. So we can see very distant clusters of galaxies in this effect. And this particular program is very important because it allows us to boost our instrumental capabilities in particular in terms of our digital process. So part of the digital development uh, in electronics in IA has been driven by this particular project. And then in ALMA, uh, I mentioned that we deliver many things. And one is this uh, testing and calibration and assembly of all the receivers. So we actually uh, built and uh, tested and uh, calibrated and then integrated and shipped to uh, ALMA 17 units uh, for Japan. And then after we finished, we did five more for North America and four more for Japan. So, you know, this shows that, you know, when you are working hard, we can actually catch up to the senior partners in the project because we have no experience in uh, building such receiver systems or, or such large cryostats. Uh, however, because of our work on the submillimeter array, you know, we were able to uh, uh, work in this particular technical field, but then also we are working with the industry. So the industry give us strong support in uh, providing manpower, space, and effort in terms of making these kind of uh, large productions. And then we also delivered a front-end service vehicle. We delivered the sub-reflector uh, sub system. Uh, so that all was very successful. In 2003, 13, uh, this was actually uh, inauguration day of ALMA when uh, this is Frank Xu, uh, who is the starter of, uh, uh, initiated the IAA uh, development. And this is uh, Wu Ma Guan, who is a, a low temperature physicist, who was actually uh, head of the uh, Minister of Science and Technology that had approved the uh, uh, construction of ALMA or our participation in ALMA. So that was a great day uh, in, uh, in ALMA, operating since 2013, of course, with many important results that you, you are all familiar with. Um, and now from this project, ALMA, uh, we noted that you know, the prototype antennas will be available because you know, the prototype antennas were developed in North America, also in Japan, and also in uh, Europe. Uh, Japan retooled their prototype and it's now one of the elements of, uh, of the uh, compact array uh, in Chile. But North America basically uh, built their 25 elements uh, after the development of the prototype. So we asked and proposed to acquire that element in order to repurpose it for what we call the Greenland Telescope Project. And the purpose of that was to provide the longest baseline uh, to work together with ALMA in the VLVI mode, okay? So this project uh, was to bring the telescope to Greenland in order to uh, do the interferometry with ALMA. You can see it barely can get to ALMA so that we are okay to cover the Northern sky together with our uh, Hawaiian station of the SMA and later on JCMT. So this is the first major observatory in the Arctic region because actually there's hardly anything there. There are only uh, ice core study people, no astronomy to speak of up there. So it will be something, a uh, big effort, you know, to deploy. Uh, so uh, we are working, uh, of course, then once we're deployed there, can form this largest triangle, uh, which achieved the highest angular resolution. So. This was something that we planned starting already with ALMA when ALMA would join the ALMA project. So this was something that we thought uh, would be able to extend Taiwan's collaboration and have a Taiwan-led part of ALMA project. So this became part of the project of our ALMA development. So you can see the path, right, from radio going from SMA to ALMA and then from ALMA to the Greenland Telescope. So, uh, the idea of this, of course, is a uh, uh, size scale of the radio emission. Of course, uh, the resolution just goes as lambda over D. So you maximize D and then you go to the shortest wavelength. And you know, with 9,000 kilometer, we get to a resolution of 10 micro arc seconds, which we calculated was sufficient to resolve the black hole uh, shadow image, right? 
So, you know, we did this calculation very early on and you knew the expectation, you see the shadow and the shadow shape and the shadow size, uh, of course, tells you the basic physics, right? The size is a metric on measuring how much mass there is. And the shape, of course, will determine by the orientation and the flow and the optically thin versus optically thick. And then the rotation of the black hole itself uh, can affect the size scale and shape of the black hole. So that is the target that we started. And the project took some time. Uh, it's been 10 years since we competed and was granted the, uh, uh, the prototype antenna. So the prototype antenna was located in uh, New Mexico. We actually had to send out various parts of the telescope to be retrofitted in order to get to polar condition because at polar condition at minus uh, 30 degrees, uh, everything becomes very brittle, including steel. So this becomes a problem. Um, if you're slewing the antenna, the telescope can actually uh, fracture. That would be a bad thing. So various parts were sent out, you know, to be redone, uh, replaced, and then we reassembled it at the Norfolk Naval Base as our first uh, retrofit position to make sure everything fit back together again. So this is a rough fit of everything. And then this was put onto a boat. Uh, the NSF has a boat every year, once a year, that leaves from Norfolk uh, into Greenland. This is the Greenland uh, Thule Air Force Base here. And this is a deep water port so that a boat can come in. But because of the icy condition, there's only a limited time frame during which the boat can come in. So we only get one boat per year from Norfolk into Greenland. There's also a two more boats that comes over from Denmark. So, so retrofit happened and then, you know, we put onto the boat in 2016 and then get to the Air Force Base in July, 2016. And then, you know, our original idea was to assemble for first light and then try to get to the summit in a year after. In fact, getting to the summit turns out to be not an easy job, okay? And then, the, however, the reassembly effort was successful. Um, here you can see the Air Force Base. Uh, you know, we are basically found a position that is just off the runway. We found a spot you can see here. I think this is a Google Sky image. Uh, you can see the uh, runway and off of it is a, used to be a landing pad, a pad where an airplane is held. Uh, there's less airplane activity in Greenland Air Force Base now. So we utilize one of these concrete pads to put the telescope on. And there are also, of course, warehouses, uh, large warehouses inside the Air Force Base on which we did some of our assembly work, especially the backup structure. Because it's so cold, you need to be out inside in order to be able to work efficiently. So here we are shipping across the Greenland in 2016. Uh, I'm actually standing over here on the boat, watching them loading onto the bigger boat. This is a tugboat where the parts has to be moved. And the reason why we're doing this with the tugboat at the Naval base is because the, the entrance of the Naval base are blockaded so that wide loads cannot come in. That is actually a measure against terrorism uh, in those days, in the 2016 timeframe. Anyway, this boat came into Thule and uh, going there, you know, usually we fly by C-17. Uh, here I am on this particular military jet flying through Canada, you know, to get to Thule Air Force Base. Okay, once on site in 2016, you know, we did the reassembly work. Uh, so this is done by ourselves uh, with the help of the engineering team on base. So for example, the engineering team on the base actually had this very fancy uh, uh, lifting device. You know, it's, uh, it's able to just have the right height and the right weight tolerance to lift the yoke and the receiver cabin on top of the uh, mount. So this is done by a crane, but then this particular part is placed on with this uh, device, this uh, sort of a truck device, the lifting device. So in the space of two 
summers, we assembled the mount uh, in 2016. And then the backup structure was also assembled in the warehouse in 2016. And then winter came and we had to stop. And then 2017, uh, the reflector was actually lifted onto the uh, mount itself, onto the invar cone. Uh, you might recognize some of these parts. But we also added side cabins, which was constructed in Taiwan. This allowed us to have sort of a Naismith effect, Naismith uh, ability uh, e eventually, although at the moment our receiver system is still in the receiver cabin at the, at the focus. And then, uh, uh, but we have a lot of electronics that have to be housed and that is in the side cabin. So this is a different configuration than Alma in Ch Chile because the weather conditions are so terrible that we have to protect the instruments in a closed uh, environment. So this involved you know, industry in Taiwan to help us uh, get that done. And so today, you, know, you can see we are in the North Pole, as you can see the Star Trek, uh, we are actually operating. And the goal is to get to the summit. Uh, the summit is at uh, 3000 meters. Uh, we think uh, up there, the sky is of course much, much better. Um, the water content is much reduced and it is uh, equivalent uh, and to Alma site. Uh, it has an advantage actually in the North Pole, even though it's uh, Transmission is poor in the summer months because it gets wet and warm. But in the winter months, the main advantage is that it is always at the nighttime, right? So therefore there's no day night effects so that the thermal environment for the telescope is quite stable up top. And then uh, the uh, conditions are rather uh, okay, except during storm situation, which will come and go. But this weather pattern is such that when the weather clears up, it actually has very good weather for weeks at a time, okay? Not hours, not days, but sometimes a week or more, you get good weather. And we know this because we have a testing radiometer that we have deployed into uh, the top over here on top of this uh, uh, residential building called the big house. On top, we have put our radiometer to test and over time, we can see what the uh, uh, sky conditions are like and this uh, sequence of good weather. So actually it's a very interesting and good site. You can see here the tents. This is for the summer months. Uh, people live in tents because this big house can only accommodate about five to 10 people for winter over. So for engineering runs during the summertime, people are up top in tents. This is actually a little bit dangerous because in a couple of years ago, a bear has shown up at the summit. We don't know how the bear got there walking from the coast, but the bear got to the summit. And uh, you know it's quite frightening if you are living there in a tent, if the bears are roaming around. Okay, so uh, the hope is that the Greenland will work up at even higher frequency at 660 gigahertz. At that time, you know, we will be able to form the triangle with Chile and Hawaii. These are the only site that will be able to operate at very high frequencies. And the purpose of doing that, of course, is to increase, further increase the resolution. As you can see here today, the image of the uh, supermassive black hole only has nine pixel. When we add in the GLT, uh, we actually get up to 25 pixel, but at 660 gigahertz, we will get to 225 pixel. So you can see that image will be well resolved with this grid, but moreover, Sources like M31, which is too small, and it's only one pixel worth, will become available to be imaged uh, with that kind of resolution. So this is the future, is to work on the GLT at 660 gigahertz in order to try to do that. Okay. So the other project that I want to mention is that Taiwan had joined uh, to form what we call the East Asian Core Observatory Association. And that's four regions, four major observatories uh, in China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Uh, in 2005, we formed this collaboration to try to push uh, the formation of uh, more coordinated uh, development in astronomy. This is uh, the, uh, led by Norio Kaifu right here, who is actually uh, at one point was the IAU uh, president. And he 
push very hard for the development of uh, uh, astronomy in Asia. So we have many workshops and so on. And uh, eventually we settled on the project uh, to take over the operation of the JCMT. So this is the JCMT, of course, with the windscreen peel back. Uh, JCMT is 15 meter, a little bit bigger than your telescope, but it is a very light backup structure uh, in order to handle the weight. This means that you cannot tolerate a wind load and therefore a windscreen has to be in front. So this windscreen, which is normally drawn here, uh, pulled across here, of course, uh, controls the wind environment, but also have some losses and polarization properties. So the case was a millimeter single dish. I mean, this I think is something that you should be keen on, right? And the, for the latter part of the last century, uh, 20th century, radio astronomy veered very strongly towards interferometry, as you know. You know, we built the VLA, we built the ALMA. Single dish radio astronomy sort of became very uh, disfavored because the interferometry provided tremendous resolution, right? So one might say, well, how come the optical people didn't fall into that mode, right? Why are there so many single element optical telescope out there? And the answer, of course, was the development of the CCD camera, right? We all started, you know, with single pixel experiment, you know, but optical people always work with images, right? They had, you know, large optical photo photographic plate from the very beginning. So the idea of working in the focal plane with many pixels was something that came to radio astronomy later. Of course, this is a matter of technical development, but now the large format cameras are available in the radio and in the submillimeter, right? So large cameras means that it's a say, wide field instrument, right? You can at the same time gather light from many pixels. So against interferometry, now the advantage is that you can gather a whole lot more light with a single element than you could with an interferometer because you are now doing wide field. So the submillimeter, of course, you know, had the advantage you mentioned of looking at the cold matter, can track the magnetic field, but it has that additional important point, which is that the distant universe, uh, because the inverse K effect is redshifted into the submillimeter window, right? So the distant part of the universe is just as bright as the nearby universe uh, in the submillimeter wavelength. And of course, JCMT, just like you, will be part of the Earth-sized telescope to see the shadow, right? But the main thing, JZMT, is a wide field instrument. That's why it can tackle and manage the very large magnetic field structure, in this case, with the Pole 2 camera, polarimeter on the Scuba 2. You can see a very large wide field imaging of the Orion Nebula in the, in the dust and therefore the magnetic field, right? So remind you, you know, the ALMA would be just a single pixel here, a tiny pixel here. So in order to study the structure of the interstellar medium, galaxy, and so on, you clearly need to have a, an instrument that cover a very large field of view, okay? That's wide field imaging. JCMT is also a deep field instrument, and that's because of the expansion of the universe, right? Here's the light spectrum of M82, and its spectrum as it's redshifted to higher and higher redshift. You know, it gets fainter, but the peak is rolling into the submillimeter. So in this particular window, you can see all the light from all the distance galaxies are essentially the same, right? So you can see many more. So, you know, the, the calculation is, for example, if you look at the Hubble deep field, you look at the nearby galaxies, of course you see a lot, but if you want to look at the distant galaxy in the Hubble deep field, very little is seen, okay? But you do that, in the submillimeter, you'll find that in the ALMA, the nearby field you can detect, but all the distant ones are also picked up, okay? So that's very important. It says that in this ALMA or submillimeter band, we can actually target uh, a lot of uh, distant systems. And indeed, you know, the JCMT can see just as well as Herschel at the same wavelength, but sharper because this is a bigger telescope, right? And Mauna Kea at 450 works, and that we can indeed improve upon what we can do even with uh, a space platform such as Herschel. Right? That's due to the fact that you know we get the high transparency, you can do that.
Okay. And then these submillimeter galaxies, I want to say, is quite special because they are bright uh, for clearly, uh, it turns out to be a very important effect. And that's due to the gravitational lens imaging. So, you know, from the submillimeter array, and then later on in uh, ALMA has shown that uh, these submillimeter galaxies, typically when you image them, uh, you will find that they have arcs, right? And these arcs appears not only in the continuum, but also in the line. They are clearly due to the imaging. And, you know, there are very interesting uh, physics that can be obtained, uh, very intric intricate studies. When you actually have arcs like this, you can develop the lensing model. So when you develop the lensing model, actually, in uh, some cases, you can find that, you know, the dark matter plays a very strong role. And then you can actually map the distribution of the dark matter from the lens model. And you may correlate that with the uh, foreground uh, galaxies that are doing the uh, lensing. And sometimes in one case, for example, we find that uh, uh, the dark matter component for a dwarf galaxy was much more than it was in a regular galaxy. So these things have implication for studies of dark matters. Okay, so finally, I want to wind up the talk here by reporting, uh, mentioning uh, what, is, what is the key behind of what we do, okay? So, uh, Science, of course, is uh, always looking to uh, find the fundamental physics and the fundamental breakthrough. So the key here is always going to be to develop new technology, okay? Uh, big progress comes when we have big jump in terms of what we are able to do in terms of sensitivity. Astronomy is a passive science. We only get what we get out of the sky and we have to pin them as well as we can in terms of angle, energy, and time, right? So new technology extends the parameter space that we are exploring. So when we first designed the SMA, we worried a lot about discovery space. So we worked on the parameter space that we can occupy. And even though a parameter space have no discovery yet, one should be certain that, you know, when you enlarge a new parameter space, you will find the discoveries. So new technology is very important. How much new technology? You know, I, I think that in order to make good substantial progress, <coughs> we have to aim for improvements, not by factors of 10, but factors of a thousand, right? So in ALMA and EHT, we are extending the imaging capability by factors of a thousand. So can a small country work at the frontier? Our experience in the last 25 years is that yes, you can. We can work at the frontier successfully. And finding the right people is the reason why we can get to the right problem, okay? And how do you do that? You know, you have to work at the frontier and you really do have to have godfathers and godmothers. And then you have to find always the new path. And then patience is very important. Things do not happen overnight. You have to be ready to suffer battles of defeats of uh, uh, problems, you know, year after year after year. So when you are starting in a new field, you know, you cannot be deterred by the problems that you face, okay? So guiding principle, future has always got to be better, right? That's the basic problem, basic belief. So in Taiwan, here are the key players, you know. So for us, uh, it was the uh, president of the Academia Sinica. This is a famous uh, physicist, uh, Wu Dayu. Uh, he was the president of the academy that allowed us to go forward. And after that came Yuan Li, who uh, actually allowed us to go to Hawaii and part participate in submillimeter array. And then uh, under his leadership, we actually uh, uh, joined the ALMA project. And after ALMA project, you know, Wong Chi Wei was the next president who helped us uh, continue uh, to actually deploy to Chile and now deploy to Greenland. <coughs> and then the next President, you know, is James Liao, who is very proud on the day that we were able to image uh, the uh, image of the submillimeter uh, supermass black hole. Oh, so these key people, what I want to say are what we say are the godfathers, right? And then, of course, to make progress, you actually need teamwork, right? So, you know, we cannot get done by ourselves. We have many, many partners to help us. Uh, uh, here I have a picture of a dog sled, and that's because uh, to move the telescope across the 
uh, eye sheet will be very difficult. We have to do satellite imaging, you know, to map the crevasses. We have downward scanning radars in the lead tractor, you know, to find hidden crevasses. And then my goal is to send a dog team in front of that with graduate students, just in case there are holes that we might fall into, then losing a graduate student or two might be okay, better than losing a, a tractor. So very important that we must have students. So here I stop. This is the uh, story of how we've been doing in Taiwan uh, in developing our field. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, my pleasure. Yes, it's, it's your complete and excellent presentation and impressive. So continue with the talks, the next talk. Okay, Cayus. Cayus es graduado en física en la Universidad Presbiteriana de Mackenzie y obtuvo su doctorado en astronomía en el Instituto Nacional de Pesquisas Espaciales en el INPE en el 2007. Realizó su postdoctorado en el Centro de Radioastronomía y Astrofísica Mackenzie también en, en Brasil. Eh, su área de, de interés es la física solar, campos magnéticos, atmósfera solar, solar y eh, con la radiación en, en radiofrecuencias. Cuenta con más de 30 publicaciones en el tema. Actualmente realiza sus actividades de investigación y docencia en, en la Universidad de Crucero del Sur y en la Universidad de Ciudad de Sao Paulo en, en Brasil. So uh, we welcome Caius with his talk, the solar radio behavior through the cycles, and we invite him to start his talk. Thank you very much. Caius. Thank you. That's all. Oh. Uh, me gustaría agradecerles por la invitación. Voy a terminar mi portugal aquí y dar la presentación en inglés. Okay. Well, uh, here I will talk a little bit about the, some solar aspects that can be obtaining by observing the sun uh, during the solar cycle. Uh, uh, in Kran, we have uh, made this observa these observations using many radio instruments. Um, I started with uh, the Radio Observatorio de Tapetinga. Now it's Radio Observatorio Perry Kaufman. Many of you know this instrument. It's a uh, almost 14 meters antenna operating in 48 gigahertz. So, uh, in Costa 1999, uh, they made uh, solar maps using raster scans at 48 gigahertz with a special, special resolution about two arc minutes. And they found a good correlation with the X-ray solar flux and also with the solar irradiance. This is the variation of the solar radius. So why the solar radius at radio frequency is related with the solar irradiance and the X-ray? After that, during my master thesis and PhD, I worked with the Nobeyama radio heliography and Nobeyama obtained, used it to obtain maps at 17 gigahertz since 1992. Here is an example of the Nobeyama map. Uh, it's clear here the polar brightening, this uh, bright patches located at both poles. And if you make a raster scan in this map, 
you can observe the brightening. And we stood first we stood the radius, the radius variation. We decided to measure the radius at the half power. And we obtain that the, the solar radius follow the solar cycle. And this figure at the top, we have the solar radius in arc second. And in the bottom, we have the solar uh, sunspot number. But if you look at the poles, the polar radius looks to follow uncorrelated with the solar cycle. Uh, and the, the bottom will have the sunspot number. And in the mid, medium will have the, uh, the flux intensity above the white sun. Well, during the extended minimum between 2006 and 2010, we observed that the ratios uh, reduced by almost one arc minute. Why it happens? Why, what happens with the sun to reduce the ratios? Well, now I will change to uh, a very new instrument located in Argentina, the Solar Submillimeter Wave Telescope, the SST, that observe the sun at two frequencies, uh, 212 and 405 gigahertz. In Menezes value, 2017, they studied the variation of solar radius. Uh, they defined, defined the radius at the half hour of the white sun. And they observe, um, obtained uh, a very unpredictable results which was uh, the anticorrelation with the solar uh, cycle. Uh, in the left, we have uh, the observations at um, 212, and in the right, the observations at 405 gigahertz. Question? They obtained a very good uh, correlation. Uh, but uh, this result is very strange. And Menezes uh, changed the method in a brand new paper and studied this solar radius. Uh, using the SST and ALMA, but now using the inflection points to determine the radius. So in these figures, we have the solar cycle using the magnetic field, the mean magnetic field in the gray, and the solar flux at 10.7, centimeters. The box plots are the radius. Uh, the radius was separated in distinct regions, the equatorial region and the polar region. And here we have uh, the equatorial region in uh, dark blue. And the polar region in uh, 
uh, light blue. In the bottom, we have a uh, discomposition of uh, four, 405. The results show that we have a good correlation with a solar, a solar index at the equatorial region, a positive correlation, and a negative correlation at the polar region. Why the polar region is uncorrelated with the solar cycle? This is the question. Here we have uh, some uh, ALMA maps obtained at 230 and 100 gigahertz. 100 gigahertz are in green. And we have a uh, very few single dish maps obtained with ALMA, almost uh, less than 100. So, and these maps are obtained at very specific campaigns and very expensive, expensive in time. So the comparison is very hard at this time, but uh, the ALMA maps looks to follow the SST measurements. Well, uh, now I uh, will change the topic to the lean brighton, the polar brighton that will that possible explain the behavior of the polar radius. Well, again, the Nobayama map at 17 gigahertz. In the one of the first works looking for the polar brightening, Shibazaki uh, concluded that the polar brightening observed at radio at, at least at seven gigahertz uh, have two components. The first one is that one caused by the positive gradient of temperature at the chromosphere level. And the second one is caused by the bright patches that are located at the polar regions. These bright patches can reach about a four, four, four percent uh, above the white sun. While the normal brightening is almost 10% about the wet sun. Here we can see the brightening. It, the profile in the top is a mean of the polar region. And in the bottom, we have a adjust of the limb brightening. This was published in 2003. And we have observed that the polar uh, brightening follow and correlated with the solar cycle. The poss possible explanation is a good correlation with a FACLA cycle. But uh, previous observations uh, reported that there was no one-to-one -one correlation be between the bright patches and the facular location. So they have they are located at the same region, but we don't have a uh, one-to-one -one correlation. Here we have a uh, raster scans to pass into uh, bright patches and. In the right, we have uh, the profile, the link profile. This was uh, a figure of our paper in 2010. Well, 
Moreover, uh, Svalgard and uh, Cleaver show that there is a good correlation between uh, the bright patches observed at uh, 17 gigahertz maps and the magnetic field. Here we have a, a paper uh, published by Wang in 2009 that show a reduction of the magnetic field, the polar magnetic field during the prolonged uh, minimum. It, this reduction was about 40% compared with the previous uh, maps or previous uh, cycle. And here in 2011, we obtained uh, that the polar brighten was reduced during this same period. So the polar brightening is related, closely related with the magnetic field. But we have uh, some problems with the interim telemetric images. Uh, as I have mentioned uh, before, uh, the polar bright patches observed at the Nobeyama don't have a good correlation with the bright structures observed at EUV. So NITA uh, et al. 2014 suggested that most of these small patches are not real. They are artifacts created by the imaging synthesis used in Nobeyama maps. So uh, I student make a, a new analysis using the radio synopsis limb charts. That is a uh, mean um, uh, mean profile around the limb and compare this mean profile with the EUV uh, mean profiles. So we have obtained the following results. Uh, here we have uh, the poles located at 990 nine, and 270, almost. Uh, 90 is the South Pole and 270 is the North Pole. Uh, the top images are obtained by the EUV uh, link charts and the bottom image is the 7 gigahertz chart. We can observe that at the EUV poles would have the presence of uh, coronal holes. And at the same region at the radio, we have the limb brightening or the bright patches which means that the bright patches are located at the same region as the coronal hole position. Why it happens? The bright patches are probably associated to the magnetic fields uh, located at the poles, uh, not the one pole of polar magnetic field structures, but dipole small structures emerging uh, close to this uh, to this global magnet fields. But this polar brightening it's observed at the high frequency, like the alma frequency. Yes, they are. Here we have a uh, solar uh, maps obtained by ALMA uh, during the science verification in 2015. And here we studied the polar brightening at 
these images. Uh, at the left, we have a 100 gigahertz map. At the center, the original 230 gigahertz. And the referee asked it to degrade the, the 230 gigahertz uh, to have the same resolution that 100. This uh, work was published uh, two years ago. And here we can observe the poles at point six or 230 gigahertz. And we have uh, a small bright figures or a small bright points observed at these single dish images. And here we have the observation of the poles at the 100 gigahertz. These bright uh, structures are very close, uh, are the same position, was, are the same position of uh, coronal holes that we can observe at, at the south pole here at EUV lines. Here, we can compare this. And here we have the uh, mean of the polar brightening in blue uh, at 100 gigahertz. It's a, a mean result of the six maps obtained during the science verification. And at the center, we have uh, the relative intensity of 230 giga gigahertz. It, this is a mean of uh, three maps, single dish maps, and the black lines are models. Uh, the dotted line are the comparison with the classical fall model. Uh, and the continuous black line is the comparison with a modified uh, model we have proposed in 2005 that have a good adjust with uh, radio uh, observations from 1 to 40, uh, 100 to 400 gigahertz. So the images uh, at obtained by ALMA, single dish images, clear this shows the polar brightening and but the single dish maps at the ALMA are only a secondary product. They are only obtained to calibration. We have, uh, they have obtained very good images, but not all of the single dish images are good like these ones. And they are not useful for science purpose. So, Maybe with Llama, we can uh, produce single dish maps uh, of the sun during uh, long periods to try to investigate the changes at the sun, like uh, solar radios and the polar brightening and like that. Well, uh, I have some time. I have more time, or we can finish now. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. You can use it. No problem. Okay. I go ahead. Okay. Uh, since I have more time, I will talk a little bit about uh, the active regions and our changes. Well, uh, we have two main uh, index to record the, uh, to investigate the solar cycle. 
the sunspot number and the solar flux at 10.7 centimeters. The relation between these two index or two proxies used to be uh, uh, a continuous line here at one. But since 2000, what happens? The solar flux observed at radio was greater than should be observed based on the sunspot number. So we have a disagreement between these two indexes. But at uh, 10.7 centimeters, we don't have images, only the flux. So what has happened? Why the number of the sunspot is, is smaller than should be observed? So, uh, the authors here, Livingstone and Al, suggested that the, we have some uh, active uh, regions that are not forming uh, spots because the magnetic field is not strong enough. They concluded that we need uh, 1,500 1, gigahertz to have a spot formation. Well, again, we have a lot of maps and observed, obtained by Nobeyama. And for a long period between 1992 and 2012, last year, I think last year, Mobiyama stops to observe the sun. Uh, and we decided to count the active regions. And here is our result about uh, the active regions uh, and the temperature. It follows the butterfly diagram. Uh, the active regions with observed at Nobeyama can read uh, over a hundred uh, thousand uh, Kelvin because of gyro resonance. Uh, here we show the number of uh, active regions and the poles by the poles and the so-called was a delayed cycle for about two years in relation to the North Pole. And here we comp compare the number of active regions we have counted in the top. In the center, we have the flux, radio flux at 10.7, and in the bottom, the sunspot number. We make a uh, ratio between this index, and at the top, we have the radio flux uh, divided by the sunspot number, and at the center, the radio flux divided by the number of active regions observed at seven gigahertz. And in the bottom, the number of active regions divided by um, the sunspot number. So we can observe at the center that the flux, radio flux, follow the number of active regions. What means? Uh, during the minimum, we have a reduction in this relation. But uh, when we compare the relation between the active region and the sunspot number, we have a peak during the minimum observed uh, 
around 2010. Why it happens? Problem, be, problem because we have a lot of uh, active regions observed at uh, Nobea maps that don't have a correspondence with the sunspot, with a sunspot. What means we have here, we have uh, white light images that we don't see any sunspot, but the magnetic field is present and we have the active regions there. These active regions may produce uh, small flares like type C and other events like uh, A and B uh, flares. A, B, and not flares, but C is a small flare. Okay, uh, I will finish here. I uh, only would like to show again the maps, the ALMA maps, because here we see uh, some active regions and one of these active regions don't have a, a sunspot associated to that. Uh, it was uh, studied in a recent work uh, made with a current group. I think uh, Gigi is one of the authors and myself. So I'll finish here. Ahora de, es tiempo de, del final, llegamos a fin de año y queríamos hacer los agradecimientos. Eh, Laura. Sí, ahí lo comparto. Bien. Eh, bueno, más que nada queríamos realizar un agradecimiento en particular a todos los disertantes que participaron de este ciclo de charlas durante todo el año. Eh, que han aportado mucho para, este, para el proyecto. Se han realizado discusiones muy interesantes. Eh, el aporte ha sido importante. Eh, creemos que eh, esto bueno, se ha reflejado en la participación que hubo de, de la gente. Así que estamos muy, muy contentos de haber organizado esto. Nosotros apuntamos a consolidar... En, el proyecto llama y creemos que estas actividades son, son importantes y han aportado mucho. Eh, para el año que viene se está previsto, se está analizando la, la posibilidad de realizar un workshop eh, con la intención de hacerlo en el sitio, no, no exactamente en el sitio, sino en, en la ciudad de Salta, este, que en su momento será comunicado adecuadamente las, la, la, la época del año. Creemos que pod podrá llegar a ser a mitad de año, aproximadamente en julio. Este, así que, bueno, de esa, desde, desde el proyecto Llama y en particular de la comisión que, que, que organizamos estas charlas, eh, queremos decir muchas gracias a todos por la participación. O sea, en nombre de Silvina Sichowolski, La Rosat, este, de Nicolás Duronea y Cristian eh, Germán Cristiani. Eh, muchas gracias por su, su colaboración, su este, aceptación a, a, estas, a, ese, a estas charlas. Así que muchas gracias y bueno, esperamos que sigamos en contacto entre todos y llevar adelante el, el proyecto. Muchas gracias.